welcome everyone um, to the third talk in the current Game Changer series on captivating cosmology from the Big Bang to tomorrow. So my name is Mark Sargent. I'm the EC Science Program Manager. And today we're very much still staying in the early phases of the universe. So it's my pleasure to welcome Julien Lesbourg to speak today about uh, the cosmic neutrino background. Now, I want to briefly introduce you, Jan, and then after that, I'll explain how you can ask questions um, on his presentation. So, yeah, Julien, um, as you may have seen in our newsletter, is currently professor in Aachen, professor for theoretical physics. He has been in Aachen since 2015. Julien obtained his PhD in uh, 1998 at the University of Tours. Within a couple of years, in uh, 2000, he had uh, secured one of these uh, CNRS permanent positions, which he took to the uh, university, or rather a, a laboratory in, in Ansi, um, where he worked for eight years, I believe, before moving to uh, Switzerland, to the western part of Switzerland, where he had positions at CERN and at the uh, EPFL in Lausanne. So yeah, Julien is a leading developer of numerical codes, simulating the uh, evolution of the universe on, on large scales. And uh, in case you are very captivated in keeping with our seminar series title by today's topic, you should also know that he has authored a Cambridge University Press textbook on neutrino cosmology. So yeah, I encourage you to Check that out as well. Now, if you go and look at Julien's uh, website, his University of Aachen website, you will see that he has also been involved in various outreach activities. Among other things, I saw a three minute talk explaining the universe, broadly speaking. He has more than that today, <laughs> an order of magnitude more to. Uh, Give us an update about the cosmic neutrino background, and we're very much looking forward to your talk, Julia. So for listeners who have taken part in this series in the past, you'll know how we deal with questions. For everyone else, uh, I just want to briefly describe the procedures. You, uh, in Zoom, can pose questions through the chat. Just enter your question in the chat. Or if you prefer, at the end of the talk, you can raise your hand and uh, really our technician working in the background, making sure that everything works fine, will unmute you and then you can speak to Julien directly. But yeah, that's for after your talk, Julien. Um, please go ahead, the stage is all yours and I'm looking forward to hearing about the neutrino background. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction and uh, hi everybody. So I'm really happy to talk about uh, one of my favorite topics today, which is this cosmic neutrino background, which I think shows beautifully the interplay between particle physics and cosmology. And people who are not familiar with the topic are usually intrigued of how one of the lightest and less interactive particle that we know could play any significant role on the evolution of the whole universe. Well, this is a topic of the talk. I want to convince you that this is the case. And this is a talk that has been um, designed for a wide audience um, according to the requirement of this seminar series. So the starting point is to explain the basics of neutrino decoupling. The universe is expanding and particles are diluting, which means that the interaction rates between particles in the universe tends to go down with time. In the early universe, interaction rates were usually assumed to be efficient, meaning that most particles were in thermal equilibrium with each other, sharing a common temperature. So for instance, if we imagine ourselves at a temperature of the order of a few mega electron volts in the universe, there was a thermal bath containing, uh, for instance, left-handed neutrinos and their antiparticles, because they were interacting through weak interaction with electrons and positrons, themselves interacting with photons and many other particles. So we had the thermal bath in which necessarily the order of magnitude of the number density and energy density 
of neutrinos, electrons and photons was the same. However, because of dilution, the weak interaction rate very quickly after became inefficient. And so at the temperatures of the order of 1 MeV, neutrinos decouple from the thermal bath. And after their decoupling, they keep a frozen phase space distribution, meaning their number density as a function of momentum. And this phase space distribution kept the shape of a relativistic Fermi-Dirac phase space distribution with a peak here corresponding to typical momenta given by the neutrino temperature that has been scaling from that time until now, like one over the scale factor in order to account for the dilution of neutrinos. So these neutrinos form the cosmic neutrino background that I will refer to as a CNUB. And this was found through the simple reasoning very early on. The prediction of the cosmic neutrino background is due to Alpha, Follin and Hermann as early as 1953. These people had built uh, uh, even a, a more precise model for, for this uh, background, starting from the fact that at temperature of 1 MeV, when the neutrinos decouple, we still have the same temperature for neutrinos and photons. But then something very interesting happens when the temperature drops below 0.5 MeV, which is the mass of electrons. And this event is electron-positron annihilation, mainly into photons. If you study this phenomena at leading order, you will say that all the electrons and, and positrons annihilate into photons. They give their entropy to photons, and the photons are then reheated with respect to the neutrinos, which leads to this very famous relation between the temperature of photons and neutrinos that was already found in 1953. When you want to study this mechanism more precisely, you realize that there is a very, very subdominant channel. It's really a tiny, tiny amount of the electron and positron that provide entropy or energy to the neutrinos, despite of the fact that most of the neutrinos have already decoupled at one MeV. But some neutrinos in, in the tail of the distribution are still not quite decoupled and they benefit a little bit, a tiny little bit of this entropy release, which leads to distortions of the pure Fermi-Dirac distribution of neutrinos and from this uh, approximate relation between T gamma and T nu. And when you take everything into account, you find that the ratio of the number density of neutrinos to photons in the universe at any time after electron positron annihilation until today is given by 0.68. It means that at early times, but after electron positron annihilation, 40% of the energy density of the neutrinos uh, of the universe was in the form of neutrinos and 60% in the form of photons. So there was initially a huge contribution of neutrinos. They were the second most abundant particle in the universe. And this is one of the reasons for which they are so important in cosmology. If you try to infer the properties of neutrinos today, you just need to uh, extrapolate from that time until today uh, using the expansion of the universe and the fact that today the photon temperature has been measured to be the famous 2.7 Kelvin. If you just plug this number in this relation, you find that today the neutrino temperature should be 1.9 Kelvin. And from there, you can compute the number density of neutrinos today, and it's a surprisingly large number. It is still about 340 neutrinos per centimeter cube in any part of the universe. So there are still many, many neutrinos around. This is a cosmological average. You could argue that around us in the solar system, this density should be enhanced because neutrinos have a small mass. This is something we will see more in details later on. The mass of neutrino is only important in the recent universe. But due to this mass, neutrinos tend to cluster a little bit in galaxies, which means that the density of neutrinos today around us, around the Earth or the Sun, is a bit larger than the cosmological average, but not much larger. And to compute this number, you need actually to know the mass of each neutrino species. 
And then you would find, for instance, that a neutrino species with a mass of 0 0.05 electron volt, which is a relatively realistic number, would have a number density enhanced due to uh, gravitational attraction inside the Milky Way by about 12% at the position at the sun. So you see it's a really small enhancement with respect to the cosmological average. When you know the temperature, you immediately know also the average momentum of neutrinos, and you find a very, very small number of the order of 10 to the minus 4 electron volt. This is considerably smaller than the momentum and thus the energy of the neutrinos that we usually detect from the sun or from cosmic rays with instruments like Super Kamiokande or Ice Cube. Those neutrinos having a much larger energy can be seen using scintillators, photomultipliers. There are lots of techniques which unfortunately would not work for these cosmological neutrinos. Those are way to um, have a way too weak energy and momentum. So the direct detection of the cosmic neutrino the background is unfortunately an incredibly challenging task. There have been some very smart ideas of how maybe we could build instruments detecting neutrinos. There were many interesting ideas also in the 20th century, people proposing some effects and some instruments to measure it. I don't have time to go into details. Today, the instrument which seems to be the best position to measure directly this background would be Ptolemy. Ptolemy will study tritium beta decay. And what is very interesting here is to study the excess in tritium beta decay stimulated by uh, cosmological uh, neutrinos. That is, when cosmological neutrinos hit a tritium atom, then they will stimulate some beta decay. And you will see a little feature then in the, the spectrum of the produced electrons. But this feature would be very small. It would be very difficult to detect. You would need very good energy resolution in your measurement of the electron spectrum. And so Ptolemy will have to face various issues. Are neutrinos heavy enough to be detectable? Are they dense enough around the Earth to be detectable? And are these instruments really going to work, given that you, you need really to beat some various kinds of noises and even some kind of quantum noise coming from the just Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which will make this uh, measurement very difficult. So many people are skeptical that Ptolemy will see the cosmic neutrino background. Maybe it will. Maybe another experiment, even more um, sensitive, will do it in the future. But this is not the topic of our talk. The topic of our talk is that using cosmological observations, we have already probed the existence of the cosmic neutrino background. And this is the beautiful feature that I want to advertise today. To do so, I have to tell first, uh, what is this parameter N effective that we are going to use throughout the talk? This is the so-called effective neutrino number. In fact, it's a cosmological parameter, just defined as the energy density of neutrinos, plus possibly the energy density of any other light or massless particles that could exist in the recent universe on top of neutrinos and photons. And then if you express all this energy in units of the energy density of one neutrino family, computed neglecting the release of entropy from electron and positron into neutrinos, then you get your N effective. So let's simplify this a bit. This effect of electron-positron uh, reheating the neutrinos is negligible. So more or less, we can say that the denominator here is the energy density of one neutrino family. And we expect to have three neutrino family, or if you prefer, three neutrino mass states, mass eigenstates. So this ratio should be three to one. And indeed, we expect N effective to be approximately three in the standard cosmological model. When you compute subtle effects of neutrino decoupling and of electron positron annihilation, including really an involved calculation that takes into account different neutrino flavors and neutrino oscillations in the early universe and quantum electrodynamical effects, you arrive to a number which is a little bit different, 3.044, but it's essentially three. 
And nicely, we are going to talk about cosmological observables that are sensitive to this N effective. And it gives us an opportunity to check if the cosmic neutrino background is really around, meaning NF equals three, or not, meaning NF equals zero. Next, neutrinos behave in a special way in the recent universe as a fraction of dark matter, because we know from neutrino oscillation experiments that at least two neutrino uh, families have a mass. And this is because the temperature of neutrinos today is measured or is predicted, I should say, to be smaller than the delta M square measured by atmospheric or solar neutrino experiment. And this is a proof that at least two neutrinos are non-relativistic today. And then neutrinos had a transition from the relativistic to the non-relativistic regime in the recent universe, typically during the so-called matter-dominated era. So today, they must be a component of dark matter because they are non-relativistic and non-interacting. But we know that they cannot be most of the dark matter because most of the dark matter has to be cold, which means with small particle velocities. And neutrinos cannot fall in this category. Neutrinos became non-relativistic recently. It means that even today, depending on the value of their mass, the velocity could be one or two orders of magnitude smaller than the speed of light, but not much less. So neutrinos still have huge velocities today. And for this reason, they are forming what people call hot dark matter. And they are only thought to be a small fraction of the dark matter. And to know how small this fraction is, you need to introduce a second cosmological parameter that we call omega nu. And this is simply the total energy in the form of neutrinos today relative to the total energy density in the universe. And after a little bit of work, you find that this parameter omega nu is proportional to the total neutrino mass in very good approximation, where the sum holds over the three neutrino eigenstates, m1, m2, m3. Given that we have measured neutrino oscillations, we have a lower bound. We don't have an, uh, an upper bound on this number. Oscillation do not probe the absolute neutrino mass scale, but we have a lower bound on the total mass. And using this lower bound, we know that omega nu is at least 0.005, which means that today at least half a percent of the energy density of the universe is in the form of neutrinos. It's much less than the 40% in the early universe, but it is still a lot. And it still means that neutrinos today are still the fifth densest species in the universe, according to the standard cosmological model. They are the fifth after the cosmological constant, the cold dark matter, the atoms, and the CMB photons. And this is in terms of energy density. In terms of number density, they are still the second most abundant species after photons. So this parameter omega nu has a nice property that it can also be probed by cosmological observables like n effectives. We can measure it with cosmological observations, and this gives us access to the total neutrino mass. Okay, so now what are the kind of cosmological observations that we can use in order to make these measurements? Well, there is a very famous measurement of the map of temperature and polarization fluctuations in the CMB. And we will also use in the talk the power of maps of galaxy positions or galaxy shapes which are distorted by weak lensing. From all these maps, the job of observational cosmologists is to infer statistical information, which is best summarized at leading order by a two-point correlation function for each map that we call the power spectrum. So there is a map, there is a power spectrum of temperature and polarization in the CMB that has been best measured by the Planck satellite. And there is a map of the so-called matter power spectrum. This is a power spectrum of matter fluctuation in the early universe, which is in the process of being very well constrained by ongoing experiments like BOSS, EBOSS, DAISY, or future experiments like the Euclid satellite, LSST, etc. And these experiments are very sensitive to many cosmological parameters, especially if you combine them with complementary information 
from other types of observables, like what people call distance ladders. Distance ladders are a clever way to put together information we get from especially the luminosity of Cepheids and supernovae in order to measure the expansion rate in the universe, the Hubble rate, the acceleration rate of the scale factor, etc. And also from these large scale structure experiments and the measurement of the matter power spectrum, we can extract some robust geometrical information that tell us about the expansion of the universe, of the recent universe. And a very powerful technique is called the measurement of the baryon acoustic oscillations, which are small observation, oscillations that can be observed in the matter power spectrum and that rely on the same physics as the oscillation in the CMB spectrum, that is to the propagation of acoustic waves in the early universe. So these experiments are complementary to CMB and large scale structure experiments. And then if we want to probe the much earlier universe, we can measure the ratio of abundances of helium, deuterium and hydrogen. And if we do it in a clever way, this will give us the primordial abundances of these elements in the early universe. And then comparing these measurements with the theory of big bang nucleosynthesis, abbreviated as BBN, we can have also information, especially on the expansion rate in the very early universe. So now what happens when we use these observables? Well, we can probe cosmological parameters, including N effective and omega nu, which are at the level of this presentation, the interesting neutrino parameters. Because neutrinos have many effects on the cosmological evolution. This is a specialized topic that I can only here summarize very briefly and superficially. Why do neutrinos affect cosmological observables? Well, you can make a list of effects which depend first on the time at which they are relevant. We have here the arrow of time, and we know that the universe has been radiation dominated and then dominated by non-relativistic species. This was matter domination and then by a cosmological constant. This was lambda domination. So we have big eras. The beginning of radiation domination, well, not the beginning, but some early time during radiation domination can be probed by big bang nucleosynthesis. The CMB observation probed the end of radiation domination and the beginning of matter domination. Large scale structure observables and distance ladders observation probe the end of matter domination and lambda domination. And neutrinos have effects at each of these epochs. I made here a list of five strike effects of neutrinos. Those circled in orange have due are related to the effect of neutrinos on background cosmology, on the expansion rate of the universe. And the effects circled in red have to do with the effect of neutrinos on perturbations because of gravity. So a first effect is that, as we say, neutrinos are very abundant in the early universe and they contribute a lot to the expansion in the early universe during radiation domination. So this can be probed using BBN, using CMB. If you change the neutrino density, you change the expansion rate in the early universe. On the other hand, the neutrinos still contribute a little bit to the expansion rate today, and this can be probed by observables. The distance ladder measurements probe a quantity that is sensitive to the contribution of neutrinos to the expansion rate at late time. It's a small effect, but we have precise observation, so we can see it. And in between, there is a time at which neutrinos have this transition from the relativistic to the non-relativistic behavior. And this transition has a smoking gun. It leaves a track in metric fluctuation during the epoch probed by CMB physics. And this smoking gun is called an early integrated Sachs-Wolf effect for CMB specialists. It's something that you can measure in the CMB spectrum. Now, if we go to the level of the impact of neutrinos on fluctuations in the, uh, in the universe, they are effect at early times. At early times, there are gravity forces coupling neutrinos to other species, in particular photons. And the photons tend to cluster more than the neutrino in the early universe. And through gravitational forces, you can probe the fact that neutrinos smooth the photon fluctuation in the early universe. This can be probed by observing the CMB spectrum. On the other hand, at late time, neutrinos 
have an effect called free streaming that I will describe more later on. It means that through their diffusion processes, they remain very smooth and they slow down the growth of the fluctuations of dark matter. And we will see later that this effect is very important and can be used to probe the neutrino mass. But I will come to neutrino mass effects later on. Now I'm going to give you bounds on the effective neutrino number. And before I want to do a warning, there are caveats in cosmological observations. First, when we measure cosmological uh, parameters, we always do joint fits of a model to the observations. And because it's a joint fit, there are parameter correlations, degeneracies, and the bounds you get are always meaningful assuming a given cosmological model. So most of the bounds I will quote assume a minimal cosmology, the so-called famous lambda cold dark matter parameter with six frame parameters plus our neutrino parameters. If we go to a more general cosmology, the bounds will degrade. I will show you by how much. You might be surprised that they degrade not as much as you would expect. There is another issue. Until recently, all cosmological observations were forming a very self-consistent picture. And the lambda CDM model was called the concordance cosmology model. And then it was easy to talk about bounds. Now, we are in a slightly different situation. Since a few years, there are growing tensions between categories of observations. The so most famous are the so-called H tension, which is a tension on the measurement of the Hubble rate, and the S8 tension, which is a measurement on the amplitude of the matter power spectrum inferred from weak lensing experiments. And we are very puzzled by this because these tensions could be due to systematics that are still poorly understood in some specific experiments. There are not so many experiments which are at stake here. It would be enough that a few of these experiments have unknown systematics to solve the tensions. However, the expert of those experiments say, no, no, we have tried all kinds of systematics. It's not possible. We are sure of what we say. So if the tension is real, it could call for a change of paradigm. We should maybe fit to the observables, not the lambda CDM, but a new minimal cosmological model. However, people have been trying very hard to find this new model that would solve the tension, and it's very hard to do. So we are in a difficult situation where we don't exactly know if the bounds that we quote are very solid or not, because if we have to do this change of paradigm, the bounds could change. So we will have to keep this in mind during the end of the seminar. And now I will proceed with a measurement of NF with cosmological observations. Our goal here is clearly to confirm the existence of the cosmic neutrino background. If we could probe this number NF approximately equal to three, then we would have a beautiful confirmation that these neutrinos are really there as expected. If we find a different number, it would be also very interesting. It would probe at new physics, and it could be new physics in the neutrino sector. It could be because neutrinos have new interactions on top of electroweak interactions that change their decoupling. Or maybe there could be a very large asymmetry between the number of neutrinos and antineutrinos in the universe, which is not what we expect. We expect this asymmetry to be extremely small. Or maybe it would mean that some species have decayed into neutrinos after their decoupling and reheated the neutrinos. Or it could mean simply that there are other relics than neutrinos that contribute to this effective number. So there are lots of motivations to measure this number. And this can be done very powerfully, especially by combining CMB observables by these bioacoustic oscillations. Using just these two observables, you are able to constrain an effective to be very close to three with a one sigma error bar of 0.17. This is a result from a few years ago. And it's amazing because it's so consistent with the standard prediction. And also because it excludes NF equal to zero at so many sigmas. So of course, this number has to be taken with a grain of salt. It's obtained in a minimal cosmology. But when you just complexify a bit your cosmology. You add more ingredients on lambda CDM. You assume that there are neutrino masses, that the universe could be curved, that 
uh, the cosmological constant could be a bit more complicated than you think. Well, the bound does not change very much. For instance, if you do the fit of the data with four more parameters, the bound does not change much. The error bar only increases by something like 60%. This number is strongly constrained, and that's important to stress because at some point, people said maybe NF bigger than three is the solution to the Hubble tension because there is a correlation between NF and the Hubble parameter when you fit the data. But with such good constraints on NF-active, we don't have this freedom anymore to increase NF and the Hubble rate while keeping a good fit to the data. So a large NF-active cannot be a solution to the Hubble tension anymore. So if this Hubble tension disappears due to systematics, we will stay with this prediction. If the Hubble tension appears to be real and calling for a new paradigm, a new minimal cosmological model, then this number could change, especially the central value could move. And then I cannot tell you how it would move. There is a lot of uncertainty here, but we are not yet there. We have to really prove that this Hubble tension is not due to systematics. We can compare this measurement from CMB and, B and BAO from another completely independent measurement that comes from big bomb nucleosynthesis using uh, helium and deuterium abundance measurements. And then with this completely different technique, you get a number which is in beautiful agreement with the first number, 2.89 plus or minus 0 0.23. And you see that with a current measurement of helium abundances, the error bar from this technique is not much larger than the error bar coming from the CMB. So this is remarkable that we have such a good agreement between these two numbers because they really come from very different physics. When you talk about the CMB, you talk about hydrodynamics of fluctuations in the universe at temperature of the order of a few electron volts. When you talk about big bomb nucleosynthesis, you talk about nuclear physics in the much earlier universe at much higher energy. So the fact that these two numbers agree so well with each other is amazing. It's a big success for cosmology. And maybe it's telling us that we should not worry too much about things like the Hubble tension, but this has to be confirmed on, the, on a longer time scale. It also means that there has not been any funny physics going on between the time probed by CMB and Big BN observations. Because you could imagine that between Big Bang nucleosynthesis and photon decoupling, that is CMB time, there, there is a lot of evolution in between. There is a long era. You could imagine that during this era, some funny thing took place. And there was, for instance, some particles annihilating or decaying and giving entropy to neutrinos. And in this case, you would not find the same N effective with the two types of experiments, but this is not the case. So these exotic scenarios are now very constrained. So does this mean that we have observed the cosmic neutrino background? Well, for sure, measuring NF close to three is a perfect match to standard predictions. But still, this does not prove that the particles contributing to the NF of three are neutrinos because it does not give a hint of the intimate nature of the particles contributing to this background. However, it still tells us a lot. It tells us that this background is most probably due to particles decoupled, decoupling at temperatures of the order of the MeV. Because if this background was due to particles decoupling much earlier in the history of the universe, then there would have been many more energy release into photons after those particles decoupled and they would contribute to a tiny nf remember that nf has been defined and normalized relative to what we expect for neutrinos so the fact that we see nf just of the order of one is already telling us that this is a background of particles which most probably decoupled at temperature of the order of a few mev and then we have more information than just a measurement of NF. When we look at fine details in the spectrum of the CMB, we can prove that the particles responsible for NF equals three are particles that were decoupled at CMB time. 
that is that were free streaming. If not, the CMB spectrum would look a little bit different. And this is again compatible with neutrinos. Neutrinos are expected to free stream at temperatures below 1 MeV. The CMB time is at temperature around 1 EV. So yeah, we expect these neutrinos to free stream. So it fits very well. And moreover, the fact that we find precisely three is incredibly consistent with the standard model, which relies on precisely six fermions, each of them with one chirality, because only left-handed neutrino and their antiparticle are in, in the universe. So we have a proof that we have these six fermions with one chirality that should give NF equal to three to be a very big coincidence that NF equal to three comes from something else than our three standard neutrinos. When I say six, I mean, of course, a three neutrino species and there are three anti-neutrinos. Okay, so it's an indirect proof of the existence of the CNUB, but it's a very convincing one, I think. And using CMB observations, you can keep probing properties of the, these neutrinos. For instance, you can try to put a limit on self-interaction of neutrinos. In principle, neutrinos should be completely decoupled below 1 MeV because weak interactions are inefficient. You could say, oh, maybe neutrinos are interacting with some kind of dark sector with additional types of interaction. Well, maybe cosmology would see this. And indeed, you can put bounds with CMB observations on these exotic kind of interaction. And they are not observed. There is a bit of controversy about this. I could talk more about this if you, if you wish. But um, most of uh, the experiments of the cosmological observation suggest that there are no neutrino self-interactions as we would expect from the standard neutrino model. Now, what can you learn more from the CNUB using cosmological observables? Well, you hope to measure their mass, of course, and that's also very exciting. And we know from particle physics that there is a lower bound on the mass. Uh, given a neutrino oscillation experiment, we expect that neutrinos belong to one of two scenarios. One is called the normal hierarchy neutrino mass scenario. It predicts one heavier and two lighter species, simplifying a lot. And if this scenario is true, the total neutrino mass should be at least 0.06 electron volts. And there is an inverted hierarchy scenario with two heavier neutrinos and a lighter one, predicting a total neutrino mass of at least 0.11 electron volt. So experiments, cosmological observations, are sensitive to this total neutrino mass. And nowadays, the bounds we have come mainly from what I called in a previous slide, the background effects of neutrinos. This background effect of neutrinos can be probed using the CMB, using baryon acoustic oscillations. And this is enough to give an upper bound at the two sigma level of 0.26 electron volts using mainly Planck data information. That's amazingly constraining. You see that it's not very far from the lower bound. So this is a very impressive also uh, constraining power of cosmological observables. You can make the constraining power even bigger if you combine CMB observation with bioacoustic oscillation, then you get 0.10 electron volts. You can be even more aggressive. You can use some information from supernova luminosity or from a kind of observable, which is very interesting, which is called Lyman Alpha Forest. It has to do with absorption features in the observed spectrum of quasars. And with this more aggressive type of analysis, you can even get an upper bound of 0.087 electron volts, which is very close to the lower bound here, and even below the lower bound of the inverted hierarchy. So it's only a two sigma bound. We have mentioned lots of caveats, model dependence of cosmological bounds. So we should keep uh, conservative. This is not the proof that the inverted hierarchy is excluded, but it brings strong evidence in favor of the normal hierarchy. The inverted hierarchy is put in strong tension by cosmological observables. What happens if we add 
more freedom in our cosmological model. Well, for instance, people have proved that if you take the minimal cosmological model and you add four more free cosmological parameters, you lower your bound by a factor of four. So yeah, it's much looser, but it doesn't mean that the bound goes away, that the sensitivity of the data goes away. And that's remarkable. It, it, it's the case because we have a lot of precise cosmological observations now. So we cannot just evade the bound by making the cosmology more complicated. And with a factor of four, these bounds would still be much stronger than what we get from laboratory experiments. Then, of course, if the Hubble tension is true and really calls for a change, a complete change of paradigm, a shift in the, in the minimal cosmological model, then I don't know what to say. It could be that these bounds would evolve in the future. It could be that they relax. And I don't have a definite answer on this. So there is always this caveat that if the Hubble tension gets confirmed, then maybe there is something we don't understand in the standard cosmological model. And if we would understand it, the bounds would change maybe significantly. All right. So um, these bounds on the neutrino mass are very interesting for particle physicists because they are so sensitive. Cosmology is more sensitive than laboratory experiments trying to measure the, uh, the absolute neutrino mass scale, like these tritium beta decay experiments, like Catherine, or the neutrino less double beta decay experiment that might give very interesting results, especially if neutrinos are Majorana particles. So cosmology is more sensitive, but it's more model dependent. So we are very happy to have these two kinds of observables, cosmology and laboratory experiment, because there is really an interplay between them. We need both in order to get fully convinced of the neutrino masses. And there is a nice complementarity because cosmology is really directly measuring the total neutrino mass, while the laboratory experiments are measuring some combination of neutrino masses, mixing angles, CP violating phases, the fact that neutrinos are Majorana or Dirac particles. So they bring more information. So they are maybe less sensitive for the moment, but they are still incredibly interesting. And what is really interesting is to put all these observables together. We can improve a lot our measurement of neutrino mass in the future. And this is the last point I want to make before closing. And this is due to the last effect in the slides in which I was listing the effect of neutrino masses in cosmology. And I mentioned that there is an effect of free streaming of neutrinos that slows down the growth of dark matter fluctuations in the recent universe. So I would like to explain it very quickly here. In the universe, we have inhomogeneity, so we have gravitational potential wells. And I draw here schematically a gravitational potential well. And in, the, in this well, the dark matter particles, which are non-relativistic, tend to cluster just due to gravity forces. What about neutrinos? Do neutrinos cluster in these potential wells? Well, on very wide potential wells, then yeah, maybe they would cluster. But on most of the potential wells that we can probe with large scale structure observables, the neutrinos do not cluster efficiently because they have such large velocities that they cross the potential well without stopping. Their velocity is intuitively bigger than the escape velocity from this potential well. So they free stream over the potential well instead of clustering like dark matter. Now, if we want to study dark matter clustering in the recent universe, we need to compute the dark matter clustering rate. This clustering rate is observable with large scale structure experiment. We can see how fast the dark matter has clustered between CMB times and the different times probed by a large scale structure experiment. But to compute this rate, we have to study equations that feature two opposite effects. There is the effect of the gravity force that scales like one over the square distance between particles, and this leads to more clustering. And there is the effect of the expansion of the universe that tends to to stretch everything and thus to increase the physical distance between any pair of points and then weaken gravity force and slow down the clustering of dark matter. 
So when you want to compute dark matter clustering, you have to take these two effects into account. And you realize that when you add massive neutrinos to the game, something very interesting occurs. You break the balance between gravity and expansion. Why? Because neutrinos do not contribute to extra clustering just because they free stream, as we just said, but they do contribute significantly to the expansion of the universe and to the red effect. So you break the balance between the yellow effect and the red effect, and this leads to a slowing down of the gross rate of dark matter, which at a given time is a very small effect, but this effect gets integrated over a very long amount of time, all the time needed to form structure, essentially most of matter domination and lambda domination. So because this effect accumulates at the end of the day in the recent of, uh, universe, you expect that the presence of neutrinos suppresses the clustering of dark matter by at least 5% in the most pessimistic assumption, which is the assumption of a total mass of 0 0.06 electron volts. If neutrinos are twice heavier, then the effect will be a 10% effect. So it's a sizable effect and you can try to measure it with future large scale structure experiments. So what you want to measure is a decrease in this quantity called the matter power spectrum shown here as a function of wave numbers in the universe, wave number of fluctuations. You want to see this suppression and we are in a very, very favorable position to do it because this suppression takes place on the right scales. And here I have a little schematic graph of scales or wavelengths in the universe with on the right the larger scales. So the larger scale that we could probe in principle is the observable radius of the universe. It's of the order of 1000 of megaparsec, but these scales can be probed only with CMB experiments. Then below we have smaller characteristic scale. There is a scale called the scale of equality. It's about 800 megaparsec. And on much smaller scales, there is a scale of so-called non-linearity. It's a scale below which the clustering of dark matter can only be described with a non-linear theory, which is much more difficult to build accurately than the linear theory that works on larger scales. Okay, so what are the scales probed by future, current, ongoing and future large-scale structure experiments? Well, they range more or less from the scale of equality, depending on the experiment, it could be a bit less, a bit more, but it's a few hundreds of megaparsec, down to a scale below which it's very difficult to extract information on cosmological parameters. And this scale is scale called the scale of baryonic physics. Below this scale, all the processes are much more difficult to model and it becomes much more difficult to measure cosmological parameters. The value of this scale is not well understood nowadays, but what we know is that it would be at most, and really that would be a very pessimistic assumption, at most of the order of the scale of non-linearity, which is in the range of 60 par megaparsec. What is nice is that this neutrino free streaming effect takes place on very large scales, as large as the scale of equality. And so there is a huge range of scale of more than one decade that is probed by a large scale structure experiment and on which the neutrino free streaming effect takes place. So you can probe this effect of neutrino free streaming, even if you limit yourself to scales where the physics is completely described by linear theory. And these are the scales where those experiments will have the best sensitivity. This is why we are optimistic that we are going at some point and probably very soon to see this free streaming effect and to detect the neutrino mass. So with which sensitivity? Well, by just improving the sensitivity of future CMB experiments, we will mainly increase our sensitivity to the effective neutrino number. And the next generation of CMB experiments should reach a sensitivity of 0.07 on N effective. That's nice. It's a factor two to three improvement with respect to nowadays. Unfortunately, it's not enough to probe this small correction of 044. We don't have yet a realistic design of a cosmological experiment that would be sensitive to the 044 correction. 
but still by improving our sensitivity to NF, we will be able to probe the sinew B density and deviations from it with much better sensitivity than today. And as for the neutrino mass, what we are waiting for now are these future large scale structure surveys like DAISY, which is ongoing, and there will be the Euclid satellite um, led by ESA, a project in which many Europeans like me or like people in the audience are very active. And there will be also a, a telescope in the US, uh, the LSS telescope. All these experiments will better measure the matter pore spectrum. And gradually, we expect that the error bar on the neutrino mass will decrease over the years. And already with Euclid, we expect that it will reach 0 0.02 electron volts. With, and this is a very conservative estimate, by the way, it takes into account nonlinear effects, baryonic feedback, lots of effects that could potentially be a problem for the detection of the neutrino mass. And with such a sensitivity, we are optimistic that we will get a two to three sigma detection of neutrino mass. And then with an even more futuristic generation of experiments that are already being designed and planned, like radio astronomy experiments, we could ultimately reach a four to five sigma detection, but then it will be more on a time scale of 15 to 20 years. So these are very bright prospects. And I can conclude that yes, neutrinos are the lightest and most elusive particle we know. But nevertheless, we have seen that they can be probed by looking at the whole universe on the larger scales. And that's amazing. And the reason, in fact, is that the individual energy density of neutrinos is tiny due to their small mass, small temperature. But the collective effect is huge because we have many, many neutrinos around. And that's a key point, in fact. The neutrinos have a number density which is absolutely huge, which is the second biggest in the universe. So people often say, oh, it's really surprising. Neutrinos, they are supposed to be something small that matters only a little bit. And you tell us that in cosmology, they play a big role. Why is it so? Well, it's because they are in a perfect situation to have this large number density, because most of their particles have a small number density because they annihilated at some point when they became non-relativistic, when their temperature dropped below their mass. And that's the case of most of the particles we, we know. They, they became non-relativistic at some, some point, and pairs of particles and antiparticles annihilated into photons or other things. But this is not true in the standard cosmological picture. Uh, and if you don't complicate the particle physics model too much, this is not true only for two species. It's not true for photons because they are total, totally massless and thus totally stable, they cannot decay into something lighter. And neutrinos, because neutrinos, yes, they become non-relativistic, but because they are weakly interacting, they decouple early. And so they become non-relativistic after their decoupling. And thus, when they become non-relativistic, they cannot annihilate anymore. They are protected. And this is why neutrinos and photons are so much more abundant than any other species in the universe and this is why also they can be probed so well with cosmological observables and this is my final word thank you very much for your attention and i would be delighted to answer your questions yeah thank you very much for this presentation i'm sure the audience and me very much so as one of the members of the audience will have appreciated your very helpful conceptual timelines and view graphs that was really um, super to understand the, the key concepts and uh, I'm sure the audience also shares the enthusiasm you had and uh, you have convinced the audience that the best the, the golden age of neutrino cosmology is still to come <laughs> especially with your probably not history. the audience we will see from the questions I'm not sure I'm sure I'm not convinced all the all the audience but we shall see if you have doubts uh, that's the right time to to raise your to make your point all right um that uh, is a perfect transition to again just summarizing how you can ask your questions um so you can post them in the in the chat thread uh, or simply raise your hand um i see there is already one raised hand 
So, Willi, do you want to unmute Hans Tinecker if you don't mind? Hans, unmuted. you should now be able to speak. Yeah, I, I am unmuted. So, I understood that neutrinos uh, slow down um, the dark matter clustering. That's my question is related to this. If there is no dark matter, as for example, theories like Mond suggest, or scale invariant theories of Andre Medea, is there an effect or what would that mean? Very good. So um, you know that this is a very controversial issue and I don't expect that you will agree with everything I answer. But the problem of Mond is that um, it's a paradigm and you can embed it into theories, but these theories have a hard time reproducing the CMB spectrum. This is why I'm not considering this assumption on equal footing with the other one for this very scientific reason that it cannot explain the CMB. However, when people tried to uh, fit CMB with Bekenstein theory, which uh, embeds Mond, and at some point uh, they could do it to some extent because the CMB data was not very precise and because they were also rescued by assuming a very large neutrino mass uh, of the order of three electron volts, which is now excluded by direct laboratory constraints and CMB observables. So your question makes sense only if you are ready to completely give up about uh, explaining the CMB spectrum, which is something I'm not ready to do. That's why I don't have much hope into these uh, MOND theories until they come up with um, a, a way to predict the CMB spectrum. If they would, if they would, it could be that the prediction on the neutrino mass would be different because the impact of neutrino mass on the growth of matter fluctuation would be different. And this could be possible in principle, yeah. Thank you, Julien. So next in line is Jordi Miralda, really, if you would please unmute his microphone. Hello, uh, uh, Julian. Yes, I'm Jordi Miralda from Barcelona here. So thank you for this talk, uh, very exciting. And uh, I wanted to ask, that uh, you have sh you have discussed how you could measure neutrino mass by uh, measuring directly how the power spectrum is is changing with scale, right? Uh, going to these very large scales and seeing how the free stream of effect of neutrinos varies with scale. But uh, so um, if we from the CMB we can measure the amplitude of the fluctuations, the primordial amplitude, uh, and then. Uh, I can just compare this with the measurements in the, you know, not, not so small scales you were mentioning, like 50 uh, megaparsecs or so, where, you know, we can calculate this, uh, this growth factor evolution and so on, right? So it seems to me, uh, what I'm not understanding exactly why this is not also a way to measure the contribution of neutrinos, because, uh, for example, with uh, gravitational lensing observations, we can measure quite well the amplitude and we can correct for these nonlinear effects, like, for example, the Faldarriaga and others have this second order theory that you can do very, very well, very good corrections, right? Very, very well. Uh, so, in fact, from the point of view of a large scale structure experiment, if you would analyze a large scale structure experiment, while keeping fixed your fit to the CMB experiments, the effect of the neutrino mass is mainly an effect on the overall amplitude of the matter power spectrum. So in fact, you should imagine that uh, we can measure the neutrino mass because on the one hand, we measure the overall amplitude of the CMB spectrum. And on the other hand, we, with Planck, for instance, and on the other hand, we measure the overall amplitude of the matter power spectrum, for instance, with weak lensing experiments. So we measure two different numbers. At the theoretical level, these two numbers, these two amplitudes of observables, depend on three parameters. One is the amplitude of fluctuations generated in the early universe by inflation. The second one is a parameter that you know very well as a specialist. It's the optical depth to rayonization and it tells us when rayonization took place in the universe and the third parameter is a neutrino mass 
the observed CMB spectrum has an amplitude that depends on the primordial amplitude and the optical depth to rayonization. The one of large scale structure by the primordial amplitude and the neutrino mass. Since you have two observables and three numbers, it seems that one constraint is missing. And the constraint you need to use is on the optical depth to rayonization. And fortunately, this optical depth is already well measured using CMB experiment and especially the polarization spectrum and will be better measured in the future with radio astronomy experiments. And that is a key to fix this optical depth to rayonization. That is a key to the neutrino mass because then the amplitude of the CMB will only depend on the primordial parameter AS. And then the matter power spectrum compared to the CMB spectrum will have an amplitude governed by the neutrino mass. So I hope I clarified a bit how indeed from just measuring amplitude, you can reconstruct the neutrino mass. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, well, next in line is Norma Sanchez. Hello, you can good afternoon, uh, uh, Julien, and uh, here from Paris. Um, three quick points to three quick um, answers if you could. So uh, you present a, a good prospect for the measurement of the sum of the neutrino masses with an effect and so on. But there are, uh, it should be interesting, uh, it's time to uh, cross correlate with experiments as Katrin which are measurement and not only the masses, but the absolute, I mean, and the difference. And that is very important. And um, a second point is uh, um, cosmic uh, neutrino background anisotropies, which at the high um, angular momenta in the spectrum at the scale, at the angular scales of the BAO, baryonic acoustic oscillation, could uh, produce differences if you are considering two, is, and this is the third point, um, dark matter um, as, um, or said, um, esteral neutrinos, which is another uh, modern and interesting um, um, states which are um, in the uh, um, uh, pointed pointed in the um, long time uh, um, so uh, anomaly reactors and this summer I mean the series of physical review letters with gallium and so on it's very interesting I mean neutrino sterils and also esteral neutrinos and also as uh, dark matter. And so uh, these three points, I seem, it seems to me that are at the heart of some new, uh, new physics or new, uh, uh, which it could, uh, I mean, with all this um, precision cosmology um, observations you nicely presented, perhaps it's uh, good to cross correlate and uh, uh, go ahead these other possibilities, which are not, I finish now, which are not exotic physics. This is not, uh, this not requires change in gravity, ni change in quantum field theory, ni change in the standard model of particle physics and so on. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Norma. Yeah, so uh, the first point I think uh, doesn't ask for an answer. It's a, a point that I also made, the complementarity between cosmological observables and laboratory experiments like Katrin, which really measure more independent numbers. That's very important. The CNUB and isotropies, unfortunately, okay, that would be incredibly futuristic. We, we cannot even uh, measure the CNUB background directly. So measuring anisotropies in this background is seems like complete science fiction nowadays. But let's assume that in one or two centuries, we can do a map of C, new B and isotropies. It would be like the CMB, but it would contain much less information. 
we would not have information from acoustic oscillations. The information would be dominated by the weak cleansing effect of neutrinos. And this map would be a map of a sphere smaller than the CMB sphere because the neutrinos are non-relativistic, so they decoupled closer to us than photons. So measuring the C new B anisotropies, even if it was possible, would not contain a lot of exciting information. So sterile neutrinos are very exciting, and of course, it's uh, one of the main topics of people working on neutrino cosmology, and it's also something I'm very interested in. Can we use cosmology to probe these sterile neutrinos, given that uh, they can be used to explain anomalies in oscillation data, or to uh, they can be probed uh, by X-ray physics? Sterile neutrinos can play a role in the in the mechanism for generating the neutrino mass and lots of other things. So serial neutrinos indeed are, are not very exotic. They are very interesting. So we keep trying to probe them in cosmological analysis. Many analyses are done with free parameters for these uh, sterile neutrino abundance or mass. And so far there has been no uh, net detection, no evidence for sterile neutrinos, but of course, this is something that we can should keep doing with more precise data sets. Thank you. OK, well, we're already well beyond the hour. I'd like to take two more questions. Um, the first one by Claudia Spinelli. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask, um, how should we expect the neutrino free streaming to affect the galaxy cluster number density and at which scales? More on the cluster scales, more on the less massive uh, structures? Yeah, so um, this neutrino free streaming effect, I tried to, so this is more a specialized question. So I was trying to, to be very broad and I, I summarized it by a, a, a plot like this saying, okay, there is a very large range of scales, essentially any scales smaller than the scale of equality on the lower graph, below which uh, the power spectrum is suppressed. It will not be suppressed in the same way in the spectrum that you reconstruct from weak lensing, which is a total matter power spectrum. And the spectrum you reconstruct from biased tracers like galaxy halos, because bias tracers are not directly probing the total neutrino, the total mass spectrum, but only the spectrum of clustering species. And clustering species here, uh, I mean baryons and cold dark matter. So the effect of the neutrino free streaming is a little bit smaller in the observable related to galaxy clustering than in the observable related to weak lensing. For instance, everywhere where you would have a 5% effect for weak lensing, you would have a 4% effect for uh, the galaxy spectrum. You can very easily see why analytically when you look at, at the theory. So the effect is a, a little bit smaller when you try to measure the neutrino mass from galaxy clustering. That being said, uh, we expect that Euclid will have such nice error bar on galaxy clustering compared to weak lensing that you could still have more constraining power coming from galaxy clustering than from weak lensing. That's not sure, that has to be seen on the real data, but at least they should be uh, put on equal footing. They have similar constraining power. But thank you for the question. It's true that I completely skipped over subtle effect that make it a bit different for galaxy clustering and weak lensing. Okay, and then in closing, Axel Lapo. Axel? You should be able to unmute, uh, Axel. You have, speaking has been enabled for you. No luck. Too bad. Ah, now, now you're there, Axel. You appear as unmuted, but we can't hear you, unfortunately.
All right, well, I guess maybe we should just reach out to Julien by a different channels maybe after the talk, and I'm sure he'll be happy to, to answer your question. Can you hear me or? Ah, now very, very faint, but we heard something, yes. Um, maybe better now. Yeah, okay, sorry. I was just wondering, Julien, if you could spend a few more words on this controversy on the uh, neutrino self interactions from cosmology. What are the yes. assumptions that are not agreed with everyone? Yes, yes. So there has been a very interesting series of work just testing the assumption that maybe neutrinos could self interact, not just through weak interaction, but through something much stronger that would be connected to new physics in the dark sector. So you would have the dark sector coupled to the neutrinos with new particles, new force, etc. Why not? Um, because this is very difficult to constrain also in the laboratory. And some of these works at some point said that if neutrinos self interact, then they can fit at the same time the CMB observables and the distance ladder measurement of H0. So they have been proposed as a possible solution to the Hubble tension. This has emerged four or five years ago. And since then, the, the analysis keep being updated. And the summary is the following. With Planck temperature data, this model was still in good shape. Planck polarization has kind of killed the model. Planck polarization implies that the self-interaction should be so small that it can no longer help reducing or solving the Hubble tension. But some authors keep saying that, after all, maybe there are some poorly understood systematics contaminating the Planck data at large L. And so they keep doing analysis, removing high L Planck data and replacing it by recent data from other probes like the Atacama um, Cosmology Telescope, ACT, or the South Pole Telescope. And it happens that the Atacama, uh, the ACT uh, data is very well compatible with this model. So you could buy the fact that there was a problem with Planck at large L, ACT provides a better measurement with anyway bigger errors, and then this model with self-interacting neutrinos would explain the Hubble tension. Nevertheless, if this was true, there would be another problem, not just with Planck polarization, but with the fact that you would need a very large self-interaction between neutrinos that should have been seen in some laboratory experiments, unless this self-interaction are confined to the sector of tau neutrinos and not muon neutrinos or electronic neutrinos. But this is a far-fetched assumption and I'm not very optimistic about it. So this model is interesting, but to rescue it, you need to do lots of assumptions which are not, not very natural. So I'm not very confident in this model, but I wanted to mention this possibility. And the most recent up to date is this paper by Kreisch et, et al. from uh, actually just a month ago, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Julia. Um, apologies to those of you who might have still wanted to ask questions or follow up on questions already asked. We simply should uh, stop at this point. Um, it's been a pleasure, Julia. Thanks for spending time with us today. Looking ahead to next week, uh, for those of you who plan to join again, it will be at the same time, same place uh, with Mustafa Amin from the University of Houston. And uh, on the topic, inflation ends, what's next? Uh, so yeah, well, take a slight step back in time. All right, have a nice evening, everyone, or a nice rest of the day, depending on where you are, and see you soon again. Thank you, goodbye.